Welcome, everyone. Really excited to have you joining us today. Uh, Anderson Ranch uh, has been holding these summer lecture series in Shermer Meeting Hall for many, many years. And uh, while we miss seeing you in person, we're excited to gather everyone uh, here virtually until we can safely get back together again. A quick thank you to all our National Council members. Your unrestricted support really makes uh, the ranch function uh, the way it does and gives us the confidence to offer this great programming. Special thank you to those of you who are underwriting the series. Your names were flashing on the screen uh, before we got started. And of course, uh, Toby Devin Lewis, who has been a mainstay title supporter of this program for many, many years. Uh, we've got Helen and Christina just popped in at the top of the screen. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Christina's bio has been on the screen before we got started, but if I can just throw out a few sentences. Uh, Christina is born in Chicago. She received her MFA in painting from Yale School of Art. Um, she has some great, exciting upcoming shows that hopefully we'll have a better understanding of after this program, uh, including uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, X Museum in Beijing, South London Gallery in London, uh, the Cantor Arts Center at Stanford University, and the Frame Museum up in uh, Seattle. So all we have to do is get the whole world opened up so Christina can get her works shipped around. Uh, but we're excited to see all the amazing stuff on the horizon for you, Christina, and excited to learn more about it with Helen today. So Helen, I will pass over to you. Thank you, Wait, Peter. Before I go on, Helen needs to turn on her mic. Oh. Uh, but let me add, we're gonna do Q&A through um, the Q&A function at the bottom. So if you hover over to the bottom of the screen, you'll see that Q&A function. You can type in questions at any time. And at the end of the program, I'll pop in and uh, pass those questions on to Christina and Helen. So uh, again, Helen, you sound, your sound was great. You're good. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Beautiful. So you guys can hear me, right? I can hear you. <laughs> awesome. That's important. You're the most important person right now. <laughs> who I need to have here me, Christina. <laughs> um, thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And hi to everybody who's watching from the ranch. Um, welcome, Christina. I am really sorry that um, we are not in Aspen right now. We <laughs> typically do these in a, in a terrific building on campus called Shermer Hall, which is a, a, a very kind of beautiful square meeting hall with a high gabled wood timbered ceiling and um because the weather in aspen is so beautiful usually the 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 walls kind of roll up and it's open to the air and it's a really like it's a very sweet and um beautiful setting so i'm Aww. sorry that we're not in it together and um i'm trying to summon it in some way uh and um, it's of course in the middle of a campus where people are learning about art and making art and teaching art and it's got all of the great studio vibes of um, like the best art camp situation ever so uh, next year next year <laughs> um, so uh, I've been preparing for this talk you and I have had a studio visit we were talking that we can't really remember when it was we just know it was before the pandemic, yeah. it could have been like three days a week, two months. Um, yes. <laughs> as we know, the coronavirus has obliterated the concept of time in a very powerful way for all of us. Um, but I uh, loved being in your studio with you and I can see behind you that you have been busy. Yes. Um, and we'll get to that and we'll talk about that. But I wonder if um, if I could ask Molly, if Molly, if you could just do the screen share with the PowerPoint and what will happen is, is that there are images and they'll just be on a loop and Christina and I will talk and um, every once in a while I'll break away and tell you that this is her installation from Made in LA at the Hammer of two years ago. To my mind, you were one of the standout artists in that show. I think it was the second time I had seen your work and I was very excited by it. Um, but before we do the um, that dive, I just wanted to give people a little background about you. You got your B, you were born in Chicago, as Peter said, but you're really a, a child of Los Angeles. You were raised in LA mm -hmm. and you got your BA at Hampshire College, 
which yes. is it's very un LA of me to tell your education history, but it's very, I'm still an East Coaster and people who go to <laughs> Hampshire and follow it up with an MFA at Yale have an <laughs> East Coast pedigree in terms of their schooling that, you know, I, I'm, I would be remiss not to remark upon it. But I do think the Hampshire BA is interesting because it, what I know it means about you is that you've got one of those really solid liberal arts educations under your belt. Right. You're not only a creature of art school. Um, so you make these really almost extravagant paintings of um, bodies uh, in all kinds of arrangements with each other. And often those bodies are um, naked, nude, unclothed in interesting ways. There's a lot of skin on display. And then you install your work in really interesting ways. You use wallpaper and you cut holes in walls and you, you don't treat the space uh, as a given. Uh, and you have a kind of, you know, I don't know. I know that I wanna use the word surrealism. It kind of comes to mind, <laughs> um, uh, even though I don't necessarily know exactly what I mean by that when I say it. Um, but I wanted to start with, I'm gonna ask you some questions and I wanted to start with a question because I've read a lot of interviews that, with you right. and you said something in an interview that I've never heard not only any artist say, but any other human being <laughs> say. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I have to say as, you know, a little bit of narcissism on my part, it's something I feel intensely and didn't realize anyone else felt. So <laughs> the quote is, I'm going to read it. Um, you said, the normal experience of living in your body, having that experience of not really knowing what you look like. <laughs> and I just, I feel this so often Right. <laughs> I didn't know other people felt it. I often feel it most intensely actually at the beach where right. I'm sitting in my chair reading a magazine and right. three people walk by in bathing suits and I think, does my body look like that? Is that, is that what I look like? Like I have no, I, I feel like, you know, I don't know, like I've landed on earth from another planet and I'm trying to compare my body to these other bodies. I invariably turn to someone and say, do I look like that? And that person next to me, typically my wife is like, you are high on crack. You look absolutely <laughs> nothing like that person. Right. But um, I wanted to ask you, well, one, I guess, do you think that feeling of not knowing what you look like is common? Like since you are, have been able to articulate it, do you feel it often? Do you think it's a common feeling? And if it is common, like, why don't we talk about it? And if it's not common, what does it mean that you feel that and are also someone who makes pictures of bodies? Like, I wonder if we could just sort of start yeah. <laughs> in that place, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, thank you, Callan and Peter and Molly and everyone at Anderson Ranch. Um, I'm super excited to do this talk and also very sad and now even more sad that we aren't actually in Aspen, but, um, but it's still fun that we can do it and open it up to so many people um, all over the world, so anyway excited to be here in my own studio on a laptop. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's something that everybody feels, but I do, I mean, it's something that I've been aware of and more aware of this sort of kind of jarringness of seeing my own body like in a mirror or on video or like, I mean, it's funny that we're talking about it right now in a conversation where I can see my work and your face and my face in this sort of equal grid. And so I feel like quarantine has really opened up this strange fragmentation of ourselves where we're these sort of disembodied figures that where we all have this sort of egalitarian playing field of being disembodied and seeing our faces simultaneously. Mm. Um, but we can get into how quarantine's made us all very different uh, in a little bit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that 
something that I've been thinking about more and more too is how the longer I live on this like earthly realm, I'm 35 years old. So the um, kind of just noticing my body just always changing. I kind of, I guess, thought that like you go through puberty and that's kind of the end of it. And then like maybe when you're older, things are different, but I didn't realize it would be this like ongoing thing of your body going through changes. Um, and so I think we, we have this sort of sense of who we were and who we are and sort of all the moments in between. And I think that also complicates any sort of static understanding of what we look like. So I think that when we, when we encounter another person, we're encountering them at this very sort of static moment in their long history of having all these different contradictions and different, um, you know, not even just physical appearance, like you can gain weight, lose weight, get older, um, or go through different like hormonal transformations or surgeries or sicknesses. But we also, I mean, we have so many different contexts that we place ourselves in where we're constantly shifting and changing and sort of mutating to fit in or stand out from the context that we're in in a different way of presenting ourselves. So I think that we're sort of at this strange, we, we kind of can see behind the curtain so we can see all of those moments in our life, but we're also at this disadvantage in a way because we can also see how many times we've shifted and mutated and changed so that it kind of becomes difficult to know sort of who you are at any one given moment facing another person. Um, whereas they always seem to be this sort of coherent, whole, together person because you're only seeing them really in that context of being in relationship to you. Um, and so I think in that sense, I mean, I, there's also, I mean, I think that the way that we interact with our faces is changing, whether or not it's in quarantine, but just with technology, I mean, we're becoming more familiar with how we look through selfies and through social media. Um, but I still think that there's that sort of, I don't know, this, uh, this idea of being sort of a whole or coherent being that gets undermined just through the process of living your existence, which itself is never quite as um, coherent as it is to see somebody else. And so I think that for me, I mean, really it's been that contradiction of um, how I seem to others versus how I feel living in my body and moving through the world that's really driven me to use art and use the figure uh, to try to create a language of of understanding or of comprehension that uh, I feel like can more accurately depict my experience of moving through the world. Um, and it's one that is difficult to explain through, through language, which is so linear or through, or even just through the presentation of my own body. Um, Cause I mean, one of the things that, that really sort of got me into this practice of making art was wanting to find a way to to kind of come to terms with the, I guess, way of, of how I identify with my, my racial identity as somebody who's born to a black father and a white mother, but looks, uh, usually looks white to white people especially. And so that sort of, that sort of disconnect that I've had my whole life of how I see myself versus how other people see me is something that's opened up that question on a broader sense, I guess, mm -hmm. through all through all aspects of my identity. And it's made me wonder, you know, it's something that I, I think about and I've had to think about from an early age, but I, it got me being like, well, I wonder if other people have this, have this sense as well. And the more I talk with people, the more it seems like it is on some level shared. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I certainly have that sense. I mean, I know that about you in terms of your, um, you know, racial identity. I've had it myself in terms of um, people assume I'm people. Most people assume I'm straight um, <laughs> when I'm out in the world, and mm -hmm. and I of course I never think of myself as as being anything until someone assumes I'm straight, and then I'm just like, whoa, that's weird. <laughs> like, what vibe am I giving off? <laughs> you know that, that I could be so misrecognized or un scene. Um, I, I think um, one of the things I was really curious about your work and this sense of like not knowing how you look or how you are being perceived by others or if you 
look like somebody else. Um, and I don't know how um, having a black father and a white mother and basically being a sort of white passing person as you move through the world mm -hmm. affects the next question I'm gonna ask mm -hmm. is, one of the things about your pictures that really strikes me is they seem on one way, like they're about skin and the surface of bodies, but then they also seem to gesture at the real mystery of bodies is often that so much is going on inside that we can't see. Mm -hmm. And the eerie uncanniness of that, yeah. of, that sometimes we only know that like when we're ill or when we're hurt or sometimes we know it a little more like when we're having sex or we're, we're playing sports, we're doing something very physical, you become aware like, oh, there's, this thing's got like a lot going on on the interior as well. And I'm curious if, if part of the work is about that, this essential kind of mystery in a way that we yeah. all walk around with of the inside of the body. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that definitely is the through line throughout the work, whether it's in the relationship that the bodies have just as a pictorial image, the, the physical touch that they have with one another. Um, but then also the tension, I think, between the surface of the canvas, because it's, it's gonna be difficult probably for people to see this on their computer screens, but anytime you see like a beige area, that's just raw canvas. And then there's these, um, it's, it's all acrylic paint on raw canvas. So it'll move from being these very sort of thick impasto type brushstrokes to these thin washy areas of, of more like kind of watercolory light paint. Um, so like that kind of cross hatched fence in this picture uh, is much thicker than like that washy sort of butt <laughs> moment. Um, and so, and then there's also, I, I tend to play a lot with also the edge of the canvas. So oftentimes the figures are doing everything they can to contort and exist entirely within the confines of the, of the frame of the canvas. And rarely do the figures get cut off by the edge of the canvas. Um, if they ever get cut off, it's, it tends to be through these pattern planes that interact with the figures. So it's, it's this sort of like reiterating of this, this boundary or outermost edge of definition, but then adding another one to sort of, I don't know, it's sort of like this, uh, this continual sort of like, well, if this is the limit, what's outside the limit, and then what's that limit, and on and on and on. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot about the, I guess, I guess the, in the simplest terms, you could say that what I'm thinking about in these works is the idea of these intimate moments. Um, and like you said, I mean, this idea of intimacy with sort of the inside and the outside of your body tends to come out in these moments of, um, of anything that's sort of this very embodied experience. So whether that is like sex or like, you know, physical contact with another person uh, with like a hug or with sports or through violence. Um, and then in a more extreme form of it through like sickness or through death, uh, we have these very embodied experiences and they're these sort of horrific, but also very kind of necessary moments, I think, of, of intimacy that we have. And mm. so it's, it's really, I think, quite fascinating that like these moments of intimacy kind of have to exist momentarily, because it's like to fully be embodied all the time is like, kind of intolerable, like to, yeah. to feel your body in, in all of its ins and outs and contradictions at, at, at like at all times, or to see that happening to somebody else is like, you can't stand it kind of. Um, and I think oftentimes we really, we strive to have this, even though we, we crave intimacy. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this in quarantine, like craving intimacy um, and all of its different forms. But we still like, for some reason, we still prioritize the sort of cohesiveness, like I was saying before with the other person. And so I think we, we see other people typically in normal social interactions, we see them as these sort of flatter frontal beings. And we kind of want to emulate that in our own experience. So I think oftentimes we'll kind of censor, like we'll self-censor um, our complications in order to be seen 
as like a frontal flap person in front of another person. Um, and so I think it's this, it's this interesting relationship that we have with intimacy that I'm endlessly fascinated by. And, and it's one that I think is, it's just, it's a shame if it gets sort of seen as just being intimacy is just like, you know, romantic intimacy. Um, because I think that it's actually this really complicated moment where you're either in a social interaction or even by yourself where you're experiencing this full messy complicated embodiment that is inside and outside of that mm -hmm. sort of threshold i i have so many things i want to say in response to that but one of them is i do think i was thinking about the intimacy in your pictures and i was thinking how variable it is like you kind of get seduced by them thinking like oh these are pretty sexy like these are sex <laughs> pictures and then all of a sudden you're like well, they're not really sex pictures because they're, or they're sex pictures about that very intense moment in bed sometimes with a, with a lover where you're like, okay, everything is perfect except I have this extra arm <laughs> and like, I don't know what to do with this right. extra arm. Yeah, you know, there's an arm that you can't quite figure yeah, out. You know, like you can't, there's something very humorous about the, awkwardness of the intimacy you offer yeah and, and i was um i was curious about for all of the fragmentation and potential attenuation or or it's not quite violence but disturbance of mm -hmm. the energy field let's say rather than violence per se mm -hmm. uh, and if if humor was something you were thinking about in terms of intimacy and bodies and how we navigate all this wholeness versus parts. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I I often, I mean, I think in the drawings, the humor kind of come out even more explicitly because there's also the use of language. Um, but I mean, I do think that there are moments that are just sort of either through humor or just through sort of outrageousness, I'll throw something in where I'm kind of like, that's that's crazy. <laughs> you can't put like all these bright pink flowers in this painting. Like you're a woman in 2020, you can't do that. Like, but like sometimes I'll just throw that stuff in because I think it is like another access point. Like, I mean, sometimes the saddest or most poignant things can come out of a joke um, or out of humor. And then sometimes uh, like something that could otherwise seem on the surface as being very like somber and serious, you actually kind of can't get past it because you have no reason to want to enter into that negotiation. Um, so I'll often use uh, beauty and bright colors and humor and, and also tragedy and moments of sorrow and grief that exist alongside moments that could be seen as more of like a sexual entanglement. Um, but I always, I always find it really interesting, um, sometimes more annoying than interesting, but, um, but I'm always fascinated by how the works are read by other people and how some people will see these varied scenes and other people will always kind of jump to it being just about like a sexual relationship amongst bodies. And I think that it's, I mean, one of those things that I find endlessly fascinating about working with painting is that it's a medium that we are sort of conditioned to read in a certain way and conditioned to see images in a certain way. And so I find that to be a really wonderful parallel to how we're really conditioned to seeing certain bodies or seeing certain identities. And mm -hmm. we bring a lot of assumptions to the table in order to make quick, uh, legible <laughs> guesses about what we're seeing. Like we're always trying to make sense of what's in front of us. And so I think that the the go-to is to be like, oh yeah, it's people having sex. But then if you actually look at it, you're like, well, the, the way that people are touching and like, are those bodies and are there even like a set number of limbs and hands that add up to a certain number of figures. And so I think that uh, my, my hope is that if you engage with the work and spend more and more time with it, that becomes more and more complicated, just like any intimate uh, relationship becomes more complicated the longer you sort of invest in it. Right. You brought up color several times in your answer, which is great mm -hmm. because the, the last kind of question in this, in this, you know, long first question that I've been asking <laughs> is about the color pink. 
So, uh-huh. um, I'm, you use it a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. It's almost unabashed. It feels <laughs> like, um, you know, it's a, a, it's a color with so many intense connotations at the level of gender and gender roles and femininity and all this stuff. And it's also the color of the bodies, you know, some of the body's most exquisite mm-hmm. pieces are pink right and a lot of the inside of the body is pink and i was curious if um you know what pink was doing for you and if there was a way you had of thinking about pink in terms of the way it as a color kind of traverses certain uh racial boundaries that get put up between you know, um, black folks and white folks and brown folks, you know, like that, that the pinkness is actually, it's not nude that's shared, but pinkness is shared. (laughs) And I was just curious what you were doing and if that was part of what you were doing with the color pink. I mean, it's definitely something that I, so when I, when I make a painting, I try to, I try to make decisions sort of based on observation and and through an experience of looking at other imagery and kind of what materially feels right. And and then I lay things down and then I and then I spend time to look at it and analyze it. So I try to not um, restrict myself, I guess, to kind of like a linguistic explanation for my decision making beforehand, because I feel like that will always kind of it just kind of um, cuts the experience short for me as a painter. Um, but so I, I was always just drawn to pink, I guess, initially, just as something that, I don't know, it's just, it's, I think probably because like I'm kind of pink. <laughs> like I kind of have like a pinker sort of hue to me. Um, and then, and then it's like the longer I look at it, the more I can come up with, I mean, I could come up with explanations about it being, um, being gendered. And I, I do like the idea of it being the sort of, inside the sort of uh fleshiness that's not skinness um mm. and like sometimes i mean sometimes with the figures I, I will rake combs or have like a dry brush that makes the figure and i see it being more sort of like muscle or tissue rather than skin tissue and so with depicting the figures because i'm interested in painting what it is to live in your body rather than what it is to look at a body i'm interested in painting moments of fleshiness or heaviness or boniness or aches or hotness or sweatiness. Like I'm, I'm interested in all those sensations of, of having a body rather than, um, and, and looking for instances of composition. So like the, um, the planes that will fragment and hold the figures as being compositionally ways to talk about something like race or gender um, but the, the representation of skin itself is really more to emphasize the feeling of, of your body kind of constantly having all these temperature shifts and weight shifts throughout the day. And so I just think that pink is kind of like, um, I don't know, it's just such a, it's, it's found in nature a lot, but it's also very artificial, um, which I always love that play between nature and artifice and works. Yeah, your palette really skitters to me <laughs> between being like um quote unquote naturalistic and completely commercial you know, right. you know like uh, uh it's a it's an extraordinary uh palette that's right, why I so that acrylic paint too is that it feels like such a it, it just feels so materially obstructive in a way it's like so in your face it's not trying to be natural it's like i'm working with a series of plastics basically right during- Right. And, and when folks get to see them um, in real life, which they invariably will, um, uh, that plastic quality can be there too. There, there's something, um, there, they, your pictures can look, they can be a little sticky. They, yeah. they, have a, they can sometimes feel like they might be sticky. Um, Okay, in another interview, actually, and this is something you you say frequently, so I take it to mean that 
it was really truly an important learning moment for you as a student. Mm -hmm. You said that um, at Yale, your painting teacher, Rachel, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Feinstein? Uh, yeah, Rochelle Feinstein. Rochelle yeah. Feinstein. Rochelle, sorry, I know that it's Rochelle. Rochelle Feinstein <laughs> um, said to you, uh, why don't you try to draw with a brush? Right. <laughs> and I have to say, I read that and I, I had a couple of questions. Um, as someone who neither knows how to draw nor paint, <laughs> I wondered if you could talk about the difference between drawing and painting. You do both. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe talk about what happens when you combine them, or if you'll allow me to have the metaphor, when you kind of dirty the lines between them by drawing with a brush. Right. What does that get you? Um, but if you could start by maybe just talking about for you what the difference is between drawing and painting, since they exist almost equal weights in your, in mm -hmm. your oeuvre. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, I really find that my practice is really a gestural one at the end of the day. So, um, like, I even still do figure drawing. I was just doing figure drawing, actually, on Monday um, at my house. <laughs> um, but I'll still do things like figure drawing just to practice sort of the gesture of drawing the body. Um, and so what I really find the difference between drawing and painting to be for me is largely a scale difference. So it's a scale of material, which also relates then to the scale of gesture. So, um, so with, with drawing, when I, when I entered grad school in 2014, I was finding, I, I really, I it was more experienced as a drawer. <laughs> um, and I think it's probably just because drawing is something that, I mean, you can draw with very few materials. Um, you can also eliminate color pretty easily. Uh, it's something that you can travel around with more. So I think it's just something that I've been able to do even if even if I'm working at a desk job, which I've done for many, many years, um, I can still kind of doodle in the margins of my notebook uh, when I'm on the phone with somebody. So it's this thing I'm constantly practicing. And when I started Yale, I was doing these ink drawings on 13 by 19 inch paper, which there's like a few examples in the slideshow that are um, very similar to the types of drawings that I entered grad school making. And I found a lot of freedom in this gesture of drawing and of playing with, um, with positive and negative space with line and line alone. I think again, this interest of sort of the edge of the body or the edge of definition, um, I, like a contour line drawing is sort of like the epitome of that edge of definition being defined by just the simple black line. Um, but I was really finding myself to be quite uh, kind of limited to the gesture of like a wrist motion um, and a pen. So I felt like whenever I scaled up or would add color, it felt like every decision I made was very arbitrary. Like it was just sort of filling in information rather than actually having something be a necessity to create the image that I wanted to create. Um, it felt like I was doing these interesting drawings and then kind of filling it in with paint when I wanted to make a painting. Um, and so really the, the move to painting or to drawing with a brush was one that could really activate, I think the, the scale that I always see as being sort of more of like a shoulder scale of painting. So like all of my paintings, um, this, the scale of the canvas will shift often um, from medium size to quite large. I'd say it's kind of the range that I work in, but, um, but the bodies stay largely the same size. So it's really more about how much negative space or environmental space I have to play with in the canvas, but the figures kind of can either just stand up because there's enough room for them to stand or they have to be crouched or sitting because there's not enough room for them to stand. So if they're yeah. all created. <laughs> Is, uh, are, is there something about like your wingspan or your own bodiliness that's being yeah. translated into yeah, exactly. the, the canvas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it is, it's really like, yeah, it's this, it's this sort of shoulder gesture. So it kind of the, the continuity of the body is really relating to my body making it. Um, and so I think that that's something that painting really opened up to me was it, it allowed for me to have a more bodily 
interaction with the painting and to make decisions kind of based on the movement of my own body, which um, of course really relates to these embodied <laughs> senses that come across in the canvases. So, um, so for me, painting really just opened up a larger toolbox of, of material because suddenly things could be really thick or really thin um, and I could add in color and I could add like really big brushes or really small line drawing brushes. So it, it allowed for the figure to be entirely made up of gesture rather than having any separation between gesture and uh, color or volume. So like if there's a gradient, that's because I've loaded a large brush up with a gradient of paint and then apply that to the canvas. So it's all gesture based. So it becomes this sort of this big jumble of different gestures that eventually turn into uh, figuration and abstraction existing alongside one another. Um, and I think that the other major difference I found between drawing and painting is just our like biases and relationship to both of those mediums. And so I think that there is something, I don't know, I, I think that there's something about our relationship to painting that's very specific and one that I really do like playing a lot with the expectations of what a painting can be or like what's allowed in a painting or how we traditionally read paintings um, over just a course of, I mean, I'm referring, I guess, to a specifically Western uh, way of reading paintings through or through Western art history. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that with painting, I mean, the, the first time that I brought in like raw canvas with a drawing on it to a crit at Yale, which I've talked about in some interviews is that people were immediately like, oh, why did you leave the canvas blank? And when you do that with drawing, nobody ever brings up the paper as being blank. It's like a given that the, you're, we're trained to not see paper. So that's something where suddenly I was like, oh, if people are getting really like, if it's some shocking thing that part of the canvas is left blank, then that means that this is a medium that has a ton of rules and it'll be really fun to play with those, with those rules and expectations. Uh, when dealing with like what it is to be in a body. Right. And I'd love to extend the conversation about the rules of painting um, out a little bit. One of the things, you know, last week um, in this series, I was talking with Zilka Otto Knapp and she, like you, is really playing around with the installation of her work. Like you're painting walls, putting up wallpaper, cutting out holes in the walls. So like the whole idea that a painter used to just, you know, make eight or 10 pictures and the truck would come and pick them up and then you'd hang them and, you know, like that's all, you guys are just obliterating that idea. Laura Owens as well. Um, and I wondered, not to be like too, um, loose about it like is it a chick thing is it an LA <laughs> thing is it an LA chick thing that all of a sudden that the three of you are like really poking holes in our conventional 59th century <laughs> literally like literally <laughs> poking holes in the walls literally moving things around um not, well, I think what's that about like what's <laughs> going on with you guys <laughs> well, I can't speak to anyone else, but um, for me, I think it's it's really this it's this refusal to allow anything to be a neutral space, um, and I think that there's certain identities that you can occupy where you're you confront that idea of um, how kind of dangerous the idea of something being just a neutral or like blank <laughs> spaces. Um, and I think that uh, certainly women, people of color, queer people, um, not that you know we're the only ones that can see this, but I think that there's certain lived experiences that I know I've had as somebody that occupies all three of those positions where anytime people talk about this sort of neutral space, what they're usually meaning is a space that's not neutral at all. It's just kind of, it holds this position of neutrality because people in power also share that position um, and that's how they're able to continue and maintain those positions of power is through this assumed 
neutral space. And so for me, it's, it's really uh, trying to respond to all of the factors of being in a gallery space or in a museum space. And, um, you know, I mean, the walls don't have to be <laughs> white or whole or anything. I mean, I, I want the space of the, of the building or the institution to also be, um, to make you aware of that space. And then, um, you know, not even, not necessarily from a political perspective, but I think also just using every opportunity at my disposal to also make a viewer aware of their own body moving through a space. And so I think if you're not taking anything in your environment kind of for granted, you are being made more aware of your body and how you need to interact with the space um, and how you are moving through the space because I, I guess I, at no time do I want somebody to be able to fall completely into the illusion of any one of my paintings, which is also why I kind of like that they're plasticky and tactile and that the style kind of switches and the scale is always shifting. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it really, for me, comes down to not wanting to allow for things to just be neutral or blank or not seen, especially I in find <laughs> I was afraid I cut off the end of your sentence. What were oh. you about to say? Oh, just that, especially in an institutional setting, it's important for me for there to be as little opportunity for something to just be seen as neutral. Right. One of the things I've been interested in, in how you play with the, the typical conventions of, you know, a so-called neutral space or a neutral installation is you continue some, it, it runs, how to say it, it bleeds out of the pictures themselves. So your pictures have a lot of backgrounds that feel decorative in their motif, whether it's like that lattice woven pattern that we've seen or that wall with all the stones where the figure is sort of half over it or the rosettes on the wallpaper. Um, even here in this one, the, this green and black kind of, you know, faux leopard grass pattern mm -hmm. where you can't read like what's volume versus plane, right? Like all these mm -hmm. slippages are always happening. And so many of those slippages to me feel kind of decorative or domestic. Mm -hmm. And is that something you're thinking about and the, that use of pattern, for instance, in mm. a lot of your pictures, you can see there that, you know, diamond checkerboard pattern in the, yeah. in the painting that's hung through the hole in the wall. So again, you're, do, you've got like that negative space where it almost like is the wall is framing it and framing it again mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But I'm curious about like the domestic or the decorative and its role in what you're, what you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, I'm always looking for, I mean, in, in all these works, there is typically one or more than one uh, figure, and then they are usually interacting with the raw canvas ground, and then also a single or multiple planes or environments. And so for those planes, I, I tend to find, uh, well, I guess, I guess to go back a little bit, um, in the drawings, I used to, I mean, I still do this in my drawings, but I used to in my paintings include actual language. So I would write down things on the painting and the language was sort of this, I saw it as really this anchor for the figures because the figures will oftentimes just be made, parts of them will just be made like in this one, the knee is just made from like a single line and then raw canvas. So it's sort of these I think that in order for that to be a decision, there needs to be something that really anchors the work as like a definitive end point. Um, and so for a while that was language. And I, I love the way that language could exist as this, um, I mean, visually it's very flat, it's very two dimensional, um, but it refers to something in our own memory. And so we have to complete the word or what the word means through our own recollection or relationship to that word. And so it provides enough information to get you to a really specific place, but not enough information to actually fill in any of the details of that specificity. So like if I say flower, we're thinking of flowers, but we're all thinking of probably a hundred different types of flowers. Um, and so, but I didn't like it that language, I felt like captioned the work too much. I felt like 
especially with the figure, it was anchoring the figures to, um, to a narrative end point, and I wanted to leave it more open-ended. So when I took the language out, that's really when the patterning came in. And so I see the patterns as functioning really similar to language in that they're these sort of flat, two-dimensional references to something that we need to fill in with our own memories or our own relationship to that pattern. So, um, and so I love patterns that, I, I mean, with language, I love punning and like the titles of the works all have a bunch of puns that are in them and are also pulled, usually the titles are pulled from like pop culture references, whether it's song lyrics or poetry or TV or whatever. Um, so the, the patterns and the planes that interact with the figures are also kind of pulled from this sort of everyday vernacular, um, but that also I try to find things that could have more than one location. So like a repeated flower pattern is something that feels very familiar and domestic, um, like a bedspread or a tablecloth, but it also could be a field of flowers or like flowers falling on a body of water. And so I'm interested in having these, like these moments of punning um, anchor the figure in these multiple locations because I'm, I'm very interested in being, uh, I guess, I, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the play between what it is to be in an unfixed identity position, but one that is always fixed in a specific location at any given time, you just might be multiply fixed. So, um, so it's not that we aren't like firmly rooted in our culture or in our history or in our society, but, uh, but we're firmly rooted oftentimes in multiple and contradictory states within that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that a lot of the patterns, uh, any, any one of them, you could say like, oh yeah, I've seen that like, you know, either in my grandma's house or like a grandma on TV's house, it's sort of like archetype of grandma, but then also it's like, but maybe I also saw that like, at a national park, or maybe I also saw that really, what I really saw it was on my Instagram feed, like of some influencer right. in nature. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of interested in those multiple spaces. Hmm, that's so, so interesting. You know, I know, um, I know that you're working on new paintings. I can see them behind you. I know you have a show mm -hmm. in London in, uh, at, at, the, at a gallery uh, named uh, Pilar. I don't know how to spell, uh, to pronounce her last name correctly. Can you do it so I don't botch it? Well, <laughs> I was pronouncing Koreas, but now I'm okay. like, I'm not pronouncing it. No, 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 I'm sure. I it's think it's Pilar Koreas. It's how I would have pronounced it, but I, I don't want to say it wrong. I mean, she has an incredibly great gallery with a great yeah, totally. in London. <laughs> and um, so I know you're working on a show for Pilar Koreas in, uh, in 2020, and we've shown uh, the, the big show that you had at Sean Regan at Regan Projects in LA has been on rotation as well. And I know also that you were about to have um, your first solo show at the MCA Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is my segue into my last question is just to ask you, I mean, you're one of the artists I know who like had a postponed show uh -huh. uh, at a museum because of the, um, the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're working toward a show in October, which, you know, October both feels like it's going to be tomorrow and like it might never come. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess if, I guess I wanted to know what, what was it like for you? What is it like for you painting, being an artist in this incredible time, not only of a global pandemic, uh, but also in our country and really worldwide, uh, uh, the profundity of rethinking mm -hmm. um, our, hist our country's history when it comes to, um, you know, the history of race in this country. And I'm curious how you're processing all of this upheaval. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, because on the one hand, yes, I've had many shows that have been uh, postponed and moved around and I know I won't be able to like go to my show in London most likely in October. Um, I don't know if they'll let us into the UK in October because everything's so crazy here in the US. Um, but so that was sort of like an initial just like, I, I think we've all had these sort of personal 
disappointments that we all got over months ago uh, because there's much more serious, uh, you know, crises and disappointments that have been sort of systemic and ongoing that have really now come to light in a way where everybody I think that's had to witness and experience the inequalities and the systematic um, or systemic racism and classism and, and all of these uh, problems that exist in, I mean, I'll speak just for the US because that's where I'm from. Um, but we, I think there's been people that have experienced this all along and then there's been other people that have not been as aware of it. But I think throughout the last four or five months, however long we've been in quarantine, um, all of those issues have come to the surface. Um, in very real ways. And so I, it's been interesting as somebody who, I mean, my studio, which I'm in right now is just like 10 feet away from my back door of my house. And it's like this tiny little, um, like 300 square foot studio that I paint in. And I don't paint with assistants or anything. I have a studio manager, but I don't have um, any physical assistance. So in many ways, my practice has stayed completely the same like nothing's changed about my daily work routine um right. at, other than the fact that i don't go to openings or you know dinners or parties or things like that that so are like you know we're having this talk on zoom rather than uh at right. the beautiful anderson branch um but i i've been surprised that despite that it's still been really difficult to uh to paint in this time um Mm -hmm. and difficult to stay focused and I, i've seen peter coming on is this naming is this like the like, the, like uh, oscars wrap it up music <laughs> wait till you're yeah done. the music is playing now quickly <laughs> don't don't forget to thank your mother yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, i think she's probably listening <laughs> um yeah i guess basically just i think that um it's taken a psychological toll and for me especially um especially after George Floyd, uh, the killing of George Floyd, that was the first time really um, in the last four years, like including like the Trump election and all these other times when people have been like, how do we make art? And I've always been like, you know, we keep making art. It's important to do and it's always relevant. It's always a uh, reaction to what's going on around us. So it's always, it's always relevant. You can't take that away. It's kind of like indestructible in that way. But um, but uh, yeah, I mean, after the killing of George Floyd, I was really, I actually really did question the um, the mm. purpose of art for a minute. Um, I mean, I still am questioning it, um, but it, it definitely, that threw me more than any of the other um, things over like the last four years have. And I think, I mean, I don't know, all I can figure is that it's that you have to do multiple things in this time. You can't do any one thing. I, I'm going to still make paintings. I'm going to still talk to people like you, but then there's also other engagement and work that needs to be done. But sometimes art, I think, is a brilliant way of, of having new, um, new passages of thought and new ways of making connections or conclusions that maybe weren't there before. I think that if we think of art as a process rather than a product, it's really powerful. So I think the process for me of making art is one where I will do something that's not what I expected to do and I can break away from these sort of set pathways and I think that the same can happen through the process of looking at art you can suddenly come up with new ways of looking or new ways of thinking or new ideas can emerge and so I think that process is very important to continue through that ongoing and on on changing <laughs> an ever-changing practice um but I also think that we live in a physical world and we have uh you know there's basic needs that need to be met for artists and for our communities and I think that it's been important for me to you know not can not stay just in the realm of an artist but also you know be a person and do things like donate volunteer get involved make calls um and I think diversify points of action so right thank you for that Molly I wonder I see Peter's on I wonder if we could stop the screen share because it'll give folks an opportunity to see what's happening bet behind Christina <laughs> in a slightly larger scale than just the little um thumbnail <laughs> and Peter I'm going to turn it over to you because I bet you've got questions from the audience I do I will say Helen might have set up the first one quite 
easily because several people asked about the works behind you and if you could talk about them a little bit. So maybe we could start uh, simply if you are willing to tell us a little bit about the back end. If I'm quiet and Helen's quiet, I think you will pop up on the uh, screen as the main screen for people. Okay. Um, sure. Yeah. I um, am I am I on the main screen? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm in my studio. So this is a painting right here that I started earlier this week. Um, this is sort of how I began a painting. Is I don't have any um, sketches or preconceived ideas. I really start off gesturally and um, somewhat fragmented as I make the piece. And then I really spend a lot of time looking and responding to what is actually being laid down. So it's sort of this constant tension between, um, I guess, my intended mark and then at the actual mark that exists and responding to that actuality um with more intention and then having that kind of that cycle continue until these figures start to emerge um and then i'll take a photograph usually around the stage of a painting and i'll photograph it and bring it into the computer and then i play around with um, adobe illustrator and that's the way that i figure out the different patterns and planes that come into the work so that's a way for me to play around with really an endless um, endless possibilities for how I can rein in the figures um, without having to work it all out on the surface of the canvas. So the sketching really kind of happens halfway through the process. Um, and yeah, and the piece behind me is a more completed piece. Um, and that's going to, I mean, all these pieces are going to be in the show in London in October. Um, I think they all have to go out and like on the slow boat because of quarantine messing up how things get shipped these days. But um, but yeah, that's what I'm working on right now is that show and, uh, and that's what's behind me. Well, Christina, you touched upon a few things in some of the other questions and I'm trying to pull a lot of questions together, but there were several questions about where the backgrounds um, come into your work. Like we can see one that doesn't have a background yet and now the other and you talked about the Photoshop, but also that some of those backgrounds look almost fo like photorealistic versus mm -hmm. the surrealism that kind of happens in the space created by them. And some people asked if you could talk a little bit about how those are constructed. Does that come in as a collage element? And, yeah. and so what do you think about those those interactions between kind of the bold black backgrounds and mm -hmm. the surrealists? Um, yeah, I mean, I think kind of going back to the idea of the um, of these planes and environments as being really anchors for the figures. So the, the figures are typically, I mean, there's there's moments of heavy laid down paint or patterning, especially like in the hair of the figures. But for the most part, they tend to be a lot kind of looser and, and a little more like uh, unwielding. So for the backgrounds and the, the planes, I, I do tend to have them be created through, um, through masking with either masking tape or with um, stencils that I'll I have this like really handy little laser printer that prints out like anything I've drawn on Illustrator uh, that just can get put on as kind of like a vinyl stencil and then I apply paint and then I remove the stencil. So it's all, I mean, even in person sometimes there's these uh, larger like high gloss transparent areas that people will be like, oh, is that like, did you add plastic? Is it collage? Um, what exactly is the material of it? Uh, but it's all—it's all just paint applied to canvas. But um, but it was actually a lecture from Jack Whitten when I was at Yale, shortly before he passed away, uh, that really opened up the idea, really, of like what paint could be, and especially acrylic paint, because um, I had had this sort of like bias against collage for many years, and hearing him talk and, and hearing more about his work, and you know, seeing his work in person over the years. He really had this way of um, of using paint where it could technically be, you know, acrylic on canvas, but he was using paint like a material. So I think that that really opened up the way that I think through acrylic paint. So it's like, no, I didn't apply plastic to the canvas. I applied wet paint that dried into a plastic on the canvas. So it's sort of like, I don't know, it's like a fine line between what the difference is there. Um, I'm going to try to qu uh, move quickly because Helen takes back over to say goodbye and we only have about a minute left. But there were several questions um, that fell around the idea of texts and titles and you talked a little bit about your titles earlier. 
Some of your drawings have text within them, but the paintings, at least from what we looked at, don't tend to have that text. Could you talk a little bit about the use of text and when that title comes into your process? Is that precede the painting or does it reflect afterwards? Um, it always happens like midway or after creating a painting. It, it tends to be from something that gets stuck in my head while I make the painting. And I, I mean, I really use, I guess, kind of relating to dealing with the architecture of whatever space the paintings are in. I see the title as being another opportunity to sort of point a viewer in a direction. I feel like it's always good to give people as much information as they care to get into with the work. So uh, for titling the works, it's really just about uh, adding the mood or the tone that I have, my connection to the work. So the work is never strictly narrative, but the title I think can point to the story that I'm telling myself as I create the painting. Do you think differently about that within the drawings versus the paintings? Uh, well, the drawings, because they have text in it, it's like I can kind of write notes to myself as I'm making it. And then usually one of those uh, snippets of text in the drawing becomes the title. Uh, whereas the painting, uh, sometimes they don't get titled until like, you know, a few weeks after they're made. And I really want to sit with it and see kind of what, um, what I want to fix to it because, because uh, it could really be anything. <laughs> Well, I'm going to pass back to Helen, but literally there were a dozen and a half questions, but you guys did such a great job weaving through your conversation that issues about the color and about backgrounds and about imagery all seem to kind of get answered later in the, in the program. So do know I tried to paraphrase things that didn't get covered, but the audience was really engaged and I've got a lot of questions, but you seem to answer them as you flowed through your talk with Helen. So Helen, I will pass to you um, for a closing question or comment. Is she muted? Muted. Helen, Helen, you're muted. I'm sure you said something. You really hear? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I wanted to thank Christine. First off, Christine, I want to thank you um, for, you know, talking, being so open and generous to show work in the studio mid process. And mm -hmm. that's a little uh, benefit. We never could have had that if we were <laughs> uh, at Shermer Hall. But mostly I want to just thank you for that. The, really the last answer to the question of how to work now in this time. Um, I think um, it's always good to question your most deeply held values, why make art, um, and to come up with reasons to keep working towards your most deeply held value, keep making work, and then know that, you know, we live in this time when none of us can only do one thing, right? That the, that the crises we find ourselves surrounded by require um, the most of all of us in all of those different arenas you were talking about. So I found your answer to the question kind of inspiring. And um, it makes me want to say like, you know, some version of like stay in school, like keep yeah. looking at those pictures for that show in October. Right. <laughs> what we need is um, works that are as complex as yours but that also in that complexity have so much tenderness and so much beauty and so much humor. And so I really, really just appreciate you and I so appreciate the work and I'm really glad you could join us today. Oh, thanks so much. It was really fun chatting with you. Likewise, likewise. Bye everybody who's watching.